want to talk about the dark side of success. Luke chapter 12, and uh, look, let's look at verses 16 to verses 21. Uh, this story, of course, is precipitated by a man who came out of the crowd, spoke to Jesus and said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the share of inheritance with me. And the Lord said something very interesting. He said, Man, who made me a judge? over you all right who made me a judge over you and then he warned them about covetousness and then he told them the story that has uh, applications to everybody here in this room today he said to them he spoke a parable saying the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully and he taught within himself saying what shall i do since i have no room to store my crops so he said i will do this i will pull down my band bonds and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many years, many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There was a certain man in the Bible, a rich man, the Bible tells us, whose crop yielded uh, plentiful, all right? His ground was very fruitful. And this man could be any person here in Cornerstone. He could be a stockbroker whose portfolio of stocks has risen greatly in value. Or he could be a real estate developer, owner, whose property assets have dramatically increased. Or he could be a business person, businessman who has just gotten the deal of a century. Or he could even be a pastor of a very successful mega church, seeing increase year upon year. Whoever he is, he's someone who has now struck goal and he's more than, he has got more than he can accommodate. So he's got a logistical problem, all right? He does not have enough space to store his increase. So there's an internal chatter that's going on in his mind and he asks himself a question. The question he asks himself is, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops or increase? And in his mind, he replies to himself and he says, I will do this. I will pull down my bonds and I will build bigger bonds. And the whole motivation behind that is my retirement is now secured. I can enjoy life for the rest of my days. Eating, drinking, being merry and partying. But God says to him, you fool, tonight you will die. And verse 21 really is the lesson plan. It's the divine commentary on this parable. And the Lord says, so is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich or generous toward God. Pretty sobering story this is, I think. I like to call this uh, parable the bigger bonds mentality. And I think it's infected many of us, especially here in this nation of Singapore, including many successful pastors. And I'll tell you why I'm grappling with this this morning. We're now in the process, of course, you, some of you know, we're in the process of securing a second facility, which would give us more than double the current space that we have here in Cornerstone right now. If we purchase this property that we're interested in, we can grow well over 15,000 people, even up to 20,000 people without dropping a sweat because the space is that big. I mean, this space, we don't have to worry about space for the next 10 to 15 years. And as our leadership sitting down, planning our future, planning in the next short term, mid term, what needs to be done. We said if we buy this property for the next 15 years, we don't have to worry about space because there is going to be sufficient space. Now let's think about what we've got right now. We currently run about 17 services over the weekend. I'm going to be thinking that's a little crazy. Seven, I, I'm preaching five times this weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Over the last 20 years, our, in, our attendance has increased every year, year upon year. Our finances has increased every year, ladies and gentlemen, year upon year. And there's been no contraction in the last 20 years. Neither has there been ever a drop in our attendance in the last 20 years. The chart, the chart if you extrapolate it, is uh, the trajectory. The, 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 I was just breaking tongues. Trajectory of the chart is going upwards like this. It's fantastic. Cornerstone is now a large charity. Uh, which means that we have uh, over 10 million in our uh, ev revenues every year, way above that. But we, as, we have cornerstone bases in 17 different nations, ladies and gentlemen. We own the Bible College of Wales, the famous Pisgah Chapel, and now Shiloh as well. We organize the, fa the, the successful Kingdom Invasion Conference each year. Uh, the attendances are growing. Our staff count is expanding pretty rapidly. And in every conference I speak, I turn down three conferences. So yeah. Things are pretty hunky-dory in Cornerstone. Things are pretty good. Amen. 
But there's a tension in my heart and I'll explain this to you. It has to do with this whole thing of bigger bonds. Every time I read the scripture, I hold back a little bit. I want to make sure that if we ever enlarge our tents, if, if we ever purchase this new facility, it's because God is telling us to do so. Not because we have this bigger bond mentality. Not because I want to have bigger bonds. I want God to purge me from this relentless and unrestrained pursuit of success. Because I understand there is a dark side to success. And if you're not careful, ladies and gentlemen, it can lure you into a false mindset that says, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Listen, when Paul said that, he wasn't saying he was a superman. He knew his limitations. What he was saying is this, everything that Jesus told me to do, I can do by the grace of God. Come on. Hallelujah. Now, the more successful you get, you know, the more opportunities will open up to you. God, you will, the, more you will, the more you will pursue as well. Organizations want you to sit on their boards. This year, I have three invitations to sit on three different boards. Uh, not some are secular boards as well. Um, conference organizers want you to come and speak in their conference. You get invited to important functions. You get invited to nice homes. You get invited to all these places. And I want to say that this sometimes can get very intoxicating because you're surrounded by success. And Jim Collins says that this mindset leads you down the path called the undisciplined pursuit of more. Got to watch that, ladies and gentlemen. Got to watch that because all of us have to come to a place where we must be satisfied with what God has given to us. Amen. And not acquire more and acquire more because that's not the goal here in the church. The goal is not to acquire more people. It's to accommodate those that God has given to us. Am I making sense to you? Now, so our success lures us in pursuing more ventures, more projects, more opportunities and more of whatever makes me successful. And we actually start to think that we're like King Midas, you know, everything I touch turns to gold. And there are people that are just like that. Everything they touch turns to gold. And there's a danger in that, ladies and gentlemen, because we lose sight of what really is valuable to us. It happened to a man in the Bible, and I want to allude to him right now. His name was King Solomon. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, we find that whatever Solomon touched literally turned to gold. He had acquired so much wealth, so much property in his day that silver was piling up on the streets because it had no value. That's how much wealth they had. Everything was covered with gold. And Solomon had everything a man could want, ladies and gentlemen. He had the wealth of the nations. He had 700 wives. Woohoo! And 700 mother-in-laws too. And a harem of 300 concubines, the wisdom of which the likes of this world had never seen before. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you do with that kind of wealth? What do you do with that kind of power? Solomon had the same internal chatter, like this rich man in, with the bigger bonds. He had the same things that was going on in his mind. And then he said to himself, he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to test this to the limits. I'm going to indulge. I'm going to experiment with pleasure. I'm going to experiment with comedy. Laughter. I'm going to experiment with alcohol, see how much I can push to the limits. I'm going to build as, as architecturally astounding buildings, vineyards, gardens, servants, everything a man could want. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, he had this terrible foreboding. He had a sense of emptiness. And of course, you know, he couldn't put his finger why he was not fulfilled and satisfaction eluded him. And you know, the old axiom is true. If you try to chase two rabbits, you will, both of them will escape. He was trying to chase eight rabbits at one time. Trying to chase all these things. And you know, he was, somebody said Solomon was the smartest man who did the stupidest thing, all right? And here he was giving himself to pleasure and he became intoxicated and deceived by the pleasure, by wine, by women. And he ended up a serial idolater. He opened the floodgates to idolatry to Israel on every high tree, on every high hill, on every mountain. He put an idol. He brought in the gods of Molech. He brought in the, um, a God, the abominations of the Ammonites. He brought in the Baals. And he polluted the entire land of Israel with, with, with idolatry. What happened to that man? A man who had started out so well in God. Who God called Jedidiah, my beloved son. My son, I love this man. And he ended up so terribly. In Italy, there's a painting of Solomon. And it shows him coming up a flight of stairs. It's the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus is sitting on the throne and he's going to judge Solomon. And Solomon is walking up this flight of stairs. On the right side of Jesus is the redeem of the Lord. On the left side are all the condemned. And there's a puzzled look on his face because he does not know whether he belongs to those on the right or those on the left. 
What a sad ending for an illustrious king like King Solomon who was given wisdom the likes of which this world had never seen before. If you study the lives of the kings of Israel and Judah, you will find that many of them really started off very, very well, but many ended dismally and poorly. And the question we need to know is why? Where did they go wrong? When did they go wrong? What happened in their lives that made them turn around and do stupid things? Please understand that this is a process. People don't get stupid overnight. You don't have one man following God with all his heart in one season and in the next season, he's an idolater. You don't, that doesn't happen to us like that. It happens very slowly in our hearts. There's a drift, there's a decaying process that takes place, a slow dying. And before we know it, we're backslidden from God. You stop reading the Bible one day, you stop praying and you think, man, I just survived. So you stop praying again the second day and uh, you stop reading. I think it was Pastor Cho who said this one time. He said, if I don't pray one day, he said, I will know it. If I don't pray two days, he said, my, my wife will know it. If I don't pray three days, my family will know it. But if I don't pray four days, the whole world will know it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a slow decay. It's a slow process. you got to kill those little foxes that spoil the vine. The first time a man looks at pornography, he cringes because that's the first time he sees something like this. And he, there's, a, there's a recoiling. But the second time he watches it, he takes two seconds, three seconds. The third time, he wants to spend more time. Fourth time, and suddenly he's lured into this trap of pornography. And that's how people get caught. They open themselves and it's like a little fox that comes in and they don't deal with the issue. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate pornography. Let's deal with it once and for all in this church. Amen. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to introduce you to the most effective member of the church of Jesus Christ in the last 2,000 years. You want to know who he is? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, his name is the Apostle Paul. Undoubtedly, the most amazing, the most productive personality in the whole of the New Testament. I'm not in exaggeration to say, I think Paul is perhaps the single most effective member of the church ever in her last 2,000 years of church history. I don't know of any other person who pushed the boundaries of the kingdom of God more than the Apostle Paul. And I think apart from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he probably had the greatest fruit and the highest place in heaven uh, beside the Lord. He's an, he was an amazing man, single-handedly done more for the church than anyone else. Paul was an amazing individual and it's no wonder that the Holy Spirit spotlights of him in the book of Acts and devotes something like what 24 chapters 25 chapters on the missionary journeys of the apostle paul because of his commitment to the vision now here in 2 corinthians chapter 12 the apostle is describing a spiritual experience that he had experienced and in one of those amazing experiences, he was caught up into the third heavens to the paradise of god where he saw and heard things that he said he was not even allowed to take notes hallelujah that must have been some experience think about it for a few moments then in verse 7 he, but lest he becomes pr puffed up with pride, he said the Lord sent him a gift. And this gift was in the form of a, of a messenger of Satan, a personal envoy of Mr. D himself to withstand and resist Paul. Now you've got to understand that this is all in the middle of this amazing momentum. He had tremendous success. And all of a sudden, this messenger of Satan comes to buffet Paul, not buffet Paul, buffet him, all right? Everywhere in the book of Acts, you read, everywhere Paul went, this messenger of Satan tail him and he would be there waiting and he would arouse violent opposition that often ended up in physical beatings, stonings, canings. Everywhere Paul went, this messenger of Satan was there to resist him and Paul recognized that. And so he went to the Lord in prayer, not once, not twice, but three times. And he said, God, get this messenger of Satan out of my back. And the Lord said, in one of the great mysteries of the Bible, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Wow, hallelujah. Everybody say, wow. Not only that, Paul he was opposed by this messenger of Satan, but now he hears the father's sentence of death. And all of a sudden, he's thrown in a dungeon waiting for judgment and execution. Think about it for a few moments. Say you're, you, you support a particular football team. All right? Kirk, what football team do you like? Geelong United? <laughs> you support this football team, and this team has a star player. And because of the star player, the team has been winning game after game and game after game, and he makes all the difference, okay? Then all of a sudden, the coach decides 
to put the star player on the bench. And he's not even on the list of the first team lineup. And the moment he does that, the momentum of this team is broken and they start losing their games and everybody is frustrated and they're all blaming the coach for making a bad call to bench this player. And ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what is happening here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul's the star player on the team. He's your most effective apostle. He's the most productive guy in the church. He's pushing the boundaries of the kingdom. And all of a sudden, the Lord benches him. And the next thing he knows, he's put in prison. And, that, and everything seems to have, it, be over for Paul. And think about what he could have done if he had the space, if he had the freedom. Boy, think of the kingdom, how it would advance. Any coach would want to build his team around such an illustrious man like Paul with the quality, persona, passion, and the tenacity of the Apostle Paul, right? But no, Paul is locked in this smelly, dirty Roman dungeon waiting for judgment and it seems like it's all over for Paul and we all say, what a waste, man. What a waste. What is Paul doing? What is God doing? But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that if you walk with God long enough, you will know that he loves his servants far more than what we can do for him he loves us apart from the prison we won't have the prison epistles colossians ephesians uh thessalonians philippians did i mention that yeah all these great epistles all came out of that prison experience those great epistles that paul wrote while he was prison in prison influenced millions and millions and millions of christians right down to the generation until today they're still the most popular and significant letters ever written before in history and they continue to speak powerfully to us two thousand years later we're all beneficiaries of those great epistles and that was all because paul was stopped shot and thrown into prison so yeah i'm happy he went to prison I'm happy he went to prison so that we get our epistles. Hallelujah. Come on. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because some of you may be in prison right now. Not a physical one. And you're in prison not because of your sin or your disobedience but because of your success. And if it's your success that got you there, thank the Lord for that prison experience because it's the Lord who sends you there. Jim Collins, the best-selling author of the book how the mighty have fallen says the first stage in any company's decline isn't an external factor but an internal attitude and that attitude is always hubris or pride this one magazine that i keep uh, alluding to and that's the fortune magazine i used to subscribe to fortune time magazine and I, i've stopped my subscription to all these magazines because they're very pro-left all right but anyway fortune magazine is the one magazine i still get to read and when i'm on the plane i make sure i get a copy and two days ago, I was in the plane on the way from Seoul to Singapore, reading the Fortune magazine. This is one of my favorite issues. This is the Global Thousand, right? This is the largest thousand companies in the world. I like the Fortune 500 uh, issue as well. But in this, I was looking through, this is one of my favorite issues, and I look at the thousand largest companies. And in the first top 50, I will tell you names of companies that if I mention to you, you will have no idea who they are. Because the majority of the companies in top 50 are now not in America, but China. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, we ain't in Kansas any longer, all right? The power base in the world has shifted from the west to the east. I'm not prophesying. It's already done. It's happened already. China is now the new power center for the earth. And what happens in the natural is the same in the spiritual. Ladies and gentlemen, there's going to be a tremendous shift. To, of the power base of the church not in the west but it's coming to the east all right and there's a reason for that god is blessing the nations of the east in such an amazing way why so that we can take the gospel back to the west that's really important i want to show you a picture i saw this on facebook a, a couple of days and this is a definition of pride right which which is the most successful guy sure the first guy on the right he's got five thousand bucks in the bank all right but he owes the bank a million dollars he stays in this nice, humongous house. He drives a Mercedes-Benz and he has a fake Rolex, I'm sure. <laughs> the second guy has 500000 in a bank. He's got a small little house. He wears a Casio. He drives a, a, a Japanese car. Nothing wrong with a Japanese car. Just think that German cars are better than Japanese cars. Sorry. Which one is more successful, ladies and gentlemen? You don't have to answer. This is a rhetorical question. Who is actually more successful put that in your thing box i want to show you one more picture this is 
This is not part of the sermon. I, somebody, I saw this yesterday. It was so funny. I showed this to my wife. She laughed. I showed this to Tim. He laughed. And I thought, you'll laugh at this too. Show this. Sorry. This guy, he says, I, I have, I've been a bodybuilder for 20 years. He says, this is how I look. I'm 100% vegetarian. Never had non-veg, eaten non-veg. Never took a, a drugs or steroids or whatever. I, I've been, I've been, it's been very hard work. I've been absolutely a joy. I can't see it. With, uh, uh, to look at the, into the mirror. Uh, I, my aim is to become the first vegetarian. Mr. Universe, bodybuilding. My name is Guhaja. I'm the guy behind the background. <laughs> see that guy behind the background? so funny okay let's go on sometimes I read Christian these Christian magazines and in the advertisements of you've got different ministries you've got these big pictures of smiling pastors and apostles and everything is about the man the man the man I can almost guarantee ladies and gentlemen that story won't have a happy ending if the church is all about the pastor um, and not the church I think the church is in trouble. If you, name, if you know the name of the pastor and not the name of the church, maybe there's something wrong with that. Well, everybody's talking about the celebrity pastor or that celebrity apostle. Trust me, bad ending. Bad ending. There's only one champion and only one hero we exalt in Cornerstone. His name is Jesus. Amen. In our Kingdom Invasion Conference, I remember the first conference, I saw the power of celebrity pastor. We had invited a pastor to come to our church and to our conference and he came by the back way uh, to the pastor's lounge where we were hosting all the other guest speakers. And I remember him walking in and as he was walking in with his uh, personal assistant and bodyguard, you know, people were lining up and queuing up, shaking his hands, taking selfies and wanting his autograph. And, and there was a whole queue of people and, you know, and the pastor was smiling and he was saying hello to everybody and praise the Lord, how are you? And this nice smile that he's got. And I'm thinking to myself, what the heck? I mean, I've been here three days and nobody wants my signature. Nobody wants to shake my hands. Uh. <laughs> That's a fuss. To God, success is upside down. It's topsy-turvy. To be great, you've got to be small. To be first, you've got to be last. You've got to be the highest, you've got to be servant of all. If you want to go up, you've got to learn how to go down. All right? You consider the, the, the ministry of the great prophet Jeremiah. In God's eyes, probably one of the greatest men, greatest prophets in the Old Testament. You look at his ministry, it seemed like he was a dismal failure. His ministry stretched 40 years. He had literally no results at the end. He preached a message. No one wanted to listen. He was sent to a stiff-necked people who wanted to have roast prophet for lunch. Uh, he was a social outcast. All the men of Israel shunned him. He couldn't live a normal life. The Lord said you could not attend weddings, you could not attend funerals or parties. He was not permitted to marry, not permitted to have children. In his own words, he says, I ridicule all day long. Everyone mocks me. He says, those from my hometown wanted to kill me from Anathoth. And he was in prison twice, almost died one time on one occasion. And finally he died as a hostage in a foreign land, still preaching to his last breath. To to the people he hated that hated him. Who wants a ministry like this? Who wants to be part of the ministry? If, that's gonna, if this is what you call a successful ministry, then I don't want it. But ladies and gentlemen, in the eyes of God, there are very few people who had a greater standing with him than the prophet Jeremiah. He was a great man. Think about this. Even Jesus seemed to have a much, didn't have much of a success. When he died on the cross, all he had was 11 cowering disciples hiding from authorities. That's all he had, ladies and gentlemen. Can I ask you the question, are you ready to go to prison? Maybe not a physical one, but a spiritual one, because you are a prisoner of hope, amen? We're not prisoners of circumstances or prisoners of sin, but prisoners of hope. And if God sends you to prison, are you willing to yield to Him? Are you willing to let your ministry die if God says for it to die? Do you think we have a successful ministry here in Cornerstone? Rhetorical question. I think we do. I think we're successful. If we keep doing this, keep going, would people be benefited and helped? Yes, definitely. Thousands, more than thousands. Uh, let me just say this to you. There's nothing wrong with having a bigger ministry 
or a bigger congregation, but be careful with the toxic fascination of these markers, all right? If the goal is just n numbers, and that got David in big trouble, right? Because David, all he wanted was count the people. I want to know how many soldiers I had. So they counted Israel and Judah, and they found out that they had 1.3 million soldiers all ready for battle. David says, see how many men I've got. See how strong I got. David, God said to David, you're in big trouble, David. In big trouble. Because there was this pride that was in, with God, 300 soldiers is all he needs to overcome the enemy. He doesn't need 1.3 million soldiers. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, the goal is never to grow a big church. That's a false center. The goal is always to grow big people. If you've got big people, consequentially, you'll have a big church. Amen. Because people are drawn towards strong discipleships. It's not, focus is not numbers. It's for always on discipleship. And that's why it's statistically true that the larger the church, the lesser the number of people that comes to the fullness of discipleship, which is why you got to be involved in our cell groups because we do this best in the cell fellowship. Amen. And this is often a lot of people in a big church uh, do not come to the church because they're led by the Holy Ghost, but rather they, are, they come because of the reputation of the pastor or whatever they do, the music, you know, and we've got to be careful about that. I love it when I meet people in the church who say to me, Pastor Young, I've been in this church for two years. How did you come? He said, then they will say to me, the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, this is where I want you to go. This is your home. This is where I want you to be planted. And when people say that to me, I'm encouraged because I know that God is doing something to build. Amen. I plant somebody waters, but God gives the increase. Amen. Amen. And it's really important. When a church is successful, what does God do to the church? If it's bearing fruit, He prunes it. Amen. And you know, if in Israel, when they prune the vine, after they prune the vine, it's like almost all the branches are up, cut away and it's, it's like, it's almost naked and you think, can that vine grow again? And when the season of harvest comes, it's all full again, all right? There's more fruit than ever before. And you know, sometimes when God prunes us, it's very painful. But ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said this. He said, if you don't bear fruit, I will cut you off. If you bear fruit, I will prune you. One way or another, He will cut you. Amen. <laughs> so you might as well say, here am I. Cut me, Lord. I have the picture sometimes, you know, it's like the Lord has got the sharp sword. He puts it on your chest and he pokes it in a little bit and you feel the, the pain of the sword in your chest. And he says, I love you, my son. Come closer. <laughs> Amen. So when the father announces this, this sentence of death, we must yield to it. I'll tell you a story. I think this is really important. Uh, Colin Hurd is a principal at the Bible College of Wales. He resigned. Uh, for health problems and so we realized we had to pray for another new principal. So we shortlisted about four names, three names, and we started asking them about the, the process. We started bringing them into the interview process and whether they were interested and if they were, you know, we would fix a time where we could sit down with them and pray with them and talk to them about the whole uh, pr prospect of coming to be the principal at the Bible College. Of the three names, I added one more name. I put my name in the hat. I did. I put my name in the hat. I said, Lord, I'm applying for the job myself. Now, I know that I'm the chairman of the board, but I, I want to submit myself to the process that everybody else goes through as well. I want you to know I'm interested in the job. I, it's three months, three months, and I thought to myself, I think I can spend three months here, three months back in Singapore, and, you know, shuttle up and down. So I'm putting my name on this. And uh, the Lord sent someone to prophesy to me. He sent me a prophecy. And the prophecy was this, Brother Pastor Young, the Lord says to you, He says there are two directions you're looking at. Should you go this way or that way? But the Lord says to you, you are not the man that He has chosen. <laughs> and I submitted to that. I submitted. I said, Lord, uh, how many of you are, I'm so gr are so grateful that God actually tells you that He's got something else for you to do? Amen? That He can... He can direct you so accurately. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. What a great God we serve. Amen. All right. So it's, we have to be careful, all right? God is blessing us to success. Translated in ministry terms, the church just grows bigger and bigger. Money is pouring in. People are flocking in. Invitations are piling higher and higher. Your popularity rating source. Everything is hunky-dory. Everything is getting better, better and better. But every day, in every way, hallelujah. You're on the way to the top, baby, hallelujah. But just a word of warning, just a word of warning. If you find yourself in uninterrupted success, just a piece of advice, watch it. It's a bubble waiting to burst. I'm going to close with a story 
that uh, Papa Bailey told me several years ago. And the story of a young man in his fellowship who was very successful. Whatever he touched turned to gold. He was a successful young man who was pursuing a degree in dentistry. He wanted to be a dentist. And he passed all his exams with flying colors. The final exam that would cause him to graduate was the simplest exam of them all. He failed. And if you fail this exam, you can't graduate. So all the three, four years of studying has gone down the drain. He failed the exam and he panicked. He didn't know what was happening. He called Dr. Bailey. He said, please pray. What is God saying? What is God doing? I failed this exam. I can't graduate. And so Dr. Bailey went to the Lord and said, Lord, what are you saying to this young man? The Lord says, tell him, I'm teaching him to know what failure is all, like, all about. I'm teaching him to experience failure. One week later, the university called him back and said, this is the first time we're doing this, but we're letting you sit for the exam one more time, second time. They said, we've never done this before. Of course, he sat for the exam, passed with flying colors, and became a dentist. Isn't it interesting that this is part of our curriculum, that we all must learn what failure is like. In the words of Winston Churchill, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that matters. Amen? And I want to pray for you today, because some of you are, are very successful. I know this. When we first started Cornerstone Community Church in our parking yard, there are only two cars, mine and my mother's. <laughs> See, that's how we started. There were only two kids in Sunday school, Joel and Rachel, my kids. We were so small. When we called for a service or meeting, all the kids, all of them came in their short pants. They were all school students. That's how we started. We were so broke. We were so poor. But we had a passion for God. We had a fire in our hearts. 20 years later, 25 years later, I look at our car park and I see Ferraris. I see um, sports cars. I see big Mercedes Benzes. I see Lexus. I see all these uh, luxury cars. Uh, I see all these uh, amazing things. And I, I, I see all these people being blessed in the church. And everybody I meet is some C-suite guy, you know, whether it's chief executive, chief, chief financial, chief uh, T officer, hallelujah, whatever, you know. So they're all, doing, all being very successful. And I'm so proud of you guys. And God bless you for the wonderful success that you're all experiencing. Hallelujah. But I want to just warn you that this success can get into your head. So there is a dark side to this. Amen. Be careful about this un deception of this unbroken success. It's very deceiving. It's very intoxicating. The conclusion of the matter, what Jesus said in verse 21, I repeat to you, so is the man. So is the man who lays up his treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Be careful about how you hoard money. Amen. God wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. Don't hoard. Give. Be generous. Amen. Send your money up to heaven where can, rust cannot get it. Moths cannot eat it. Amen. Start building your wealth and your portfolio in heaven. Amen. Because that's where it, it's going to be eternal. Here on the earth, you know, my, my father was a wealthy man and during the Japanese occupation he had millions and millions and millions of dollars in banana notes remember the banana notes and they offered him to buy opposite the Roxy theater the Roxy theater and they said would you buy it and he had the money to pay for it and buy the Roxy theater with all the banana notes that he had and if he had done that many many years ago during the Japanese occupation I would be a wealthy son Hallelujah. But he didn't, and of course, when the Japanese surrendered, on one day, all those Japanese notes became zero value. Gone, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, that will happen when the world tail spins into a, a system of uh, buying and selling with the mark of the beast. So, we've got to be careful, all right? So, when that time happens, may your faith be strong and not fail you. Let's all stand. We're going to close in prayer. Just listen to a production of Cornerstone Community Church. Please note that all unauthorized reproduction, distribution, or sale of the recording is prohibited. For permission to reproduce or distribute the sermon, please write into mail at cscc.org.sg. We hope that you have been blessed.